Welcome to the Deep Light Podcast from Park City's Presbyterian Church. This is a space for community, healing, hope, and education around topics of rescue and growth. Our prayer for this series is that it illuminates a deeper understanding of struggles within and around us, as well as God's profound love and redemptive light in Jesus Christ. Hi, I want to welcome you to another episode of Deep Light. My name is Mark Davis. I serve as one of the pastors of Park City Presbyterian Church. And today I'm here with my good friend Chico West. And you're going to hear a little bit about his story as we kick off a series on Deep Light on addiction. Uh, and we're going to specifically talk about addiction to alcohol and other drugs and recovery and things like that in this episode. And also over the next several weeks as you hear different people tell their story and how they've encountered the realities of addiction in their life. Then we'll get into other types of addictions, um, sexual addictions, uh, process addictions, and other things in future series of Deep Light. But today, uh, we're going to visit with Chico West. And I want to begin, Chico, by just having you tell a little bit about your story. But let's start with, tell us you about you and your wife, your boys, and then kind of lead us into your story and how you've come to understand all the things we're going to be talking about. Well, hey, Mark, thanks so much. I'm no. excited to be here at PCP. See, See? <laughs> he likes to make uh, jokes. You'll see. I do. Uh, but I've been married 27 years, you know, to Shannon. Can you believe it? 27, yeah. it goes fast. It goes fast. We just celebrated. Um, we, last week, we went on anniversary slash empty nester trip. Okay. So I recommend that to anybody. I look a lot older yeah. than you, and I'm a little bit older, but we're a long ways from being yeah, empty so nesters. You, so you have quite a few more kids. Yeah. <laughs> I have two boys. Uh, my oldest, uh, Travis, just mm-hmm. graduated from the University of Texas. Mm-hmm. And he played football there, correct? He did play yeah. football there. How he, proud he, of him you he, must be. <laughs> the university. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, but in October, they're going to win. Okay. Mm-hmm. Against somebody, I'm sure they will in October. I'm not sure about the, the one weekend that we like to celebrate, yes. but we'll yeah. see. We we celebrate differently. And we, we should have some wager on that. We we need yeah. to, for yeah. sure. Okay, yeah. you'll buy. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, most likely, yes. Uh, but so he graduated. He has his, you know, full-time job now and um, great, great young man. And then our younger son, Beck is down in Austin. He's not at the University of Texas. He's trying to get in, so mm-hmm. he's doing the community college route yeah. and and doing well. And yeah. it's it's a lot of fun. That's great. You know, and so the crazy thing is, August twenty six was twenty seven years of uh, of uh, marriage for me, mm-hmm. but it was thirty three years ago prior that I uh, had my last drink. Wow. My sobriety date is two days later. After your anniversary. After my anniversary. My sobriety date is August 28th, uh, 1989. Wow. So I'd gotten out of jail, and I smoked a joint, uh, and so that's why it's my sobriety date. But my last time for alcohol was August 26th, 1989. Mm, wow. Okay, so talk. let's go to that story. When did you first realize, I've got a problem? You know, some people can drink a little, some people can smoke pot a little, whatever, but for you it was a little different. So tell that like, story. Well, I don't know if it's the first time I realized I had a drink a yeah. drinking problem because alcohol was truly my drug of choice, mm-hmm. you know, um, or some like to say DOC or I like to sometimes say drug of no choice because it I I lost the power of choice mm. pretty quickly. Mm. Uh, but I I got in trouble in, you know, earlier, you know, before coming in here, finding out that people have, you know, junior high kids, uh, the woman that helped us set up. Uh, you know, our talk to death yeah. is like seventh grade. I started getting in trouble with drinking, mm. you know, in eighth grade, yeah. you know, and then it just every year there was a, there were incidents and my parents strong believers and I rebelled against that mm-hmm. rebelled against the church. And, um, you know, my, my drinking just, uh, continued and I started using drugs mm-hmm. in high school mm-hmm. as well. And so it was my junior year of college that, you know, my last drink and drug mm-hmm. on August 28th, um, I withdrew from SMU and went and got some help. Mm. And so what, how did you get help? Like, did you tell somebody you had an issue? Did somebody tell you you had an issue? How, where'd you go for help? How'd you know to get help? Well, I, I don't, I didn't know 
where to get help mm -hmm. in that moment. Mm -hmm. I knew that my life was crashing and burning quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was at SMU, at, I joined a fraternity. My fraternity, uh, back in the 80s, they didn't do this, uh, but they told me, they put me on alcohol probation as a pledge. Mm. They wow. said, you, you they knew it was a yeah. problem. Okay. You know, but they, what, and, you know, they were 20, 21 year old kids. Yeah. And they were saying, you're, you're just weak if you can't handle your liquor, mm. you know? Yeah. And I, you know, I, I see some of those guys now around the Dallas area um, and I don't fault them. Mm -hmm. In that moment, I, I really believed it. That sure. I was a weak person. Right. You know, so it was, uh, you know, that, that happened. Um, so I, there was all, all these consequences that kept occurring. And my last drink, you know, I got arrested in Austin. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to be in Dallas. You know, I was at a fraternity house. Mm -hmm. uh, and my buddies didn't bail me out. Mm. Why didn't they bail you out? Because they kept going, Chico, every time you drink too much, yeah. you know, uh, trouble so, finds you. So they were aware, this is pretty yes. serious. So they didn't bail you out. So then what? So then I had, I had to wait a couple of days and got out on my own reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. You know, I had simple assault on a police officer. Okay. So that's why you were in jail. That's why I, why I was in jail. Mm -hmm. And so when I got out, my parents picked me up. They're, I'm from San Antonio originally, mm -hmm. and they drove up to Austin and picked me up and go, you need to do something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I spent the night at their house and I said, I'm going to go uh, withdraw from school. I need help. I cannot stop drinking. So what was going on in your heart and mind then? I mean, were you were you afraid? Were you just confused? Kind of do you remember kind of what you were processing? I I like that question. You know, I'd been struggling for a while mm -hmm. for, you know, several years. You know, I tried to stop drinking at different mm -hmm. times. You know, I I said I'm not going to smoke pot or I'm not going to drink hard liquor and I'm just mm -hmm. going to drink beer. So there was all there was you know, a lot of confusion going on, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of this despair, but people wouldn't know there was despair on the outside. Internally, there was this internal despair going on. Were you, and were you aware that what was going on on the inside, you weren't presenting to the outside? Was that something you were really aware of and paying attention to, like, and even maybe trying to create, I'm going to give the appearance that everything's fine, but inside there's this turmoil? I, I don't know if I was aware. I mean, hindsight, I I can look back and yeah. go, yes. And early on in recovery, mm -hmm. I could look back and go, yes, you know, mm -hmm. that was happening. Mm -hmm. But in the moment, it was just, I was, I was trying to perform. Yeah. I was that actor. Right. You know, I was trying to run the whole show. Yeah. Trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, everybody, the scenery. Yeah. You know, and, and keep that put. Mm -hmm. You know, but then I would come up with excuses. Okay, yeah, I'm somewhat at fault. Mm -hmm. You know, but I, I was, I was great at putting on that mask. Mm -hmm. You know, and early on, I would give people a hard time in high school that were what I called the chameleons. But yeah. I was the biggest chameleon of all. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, I was a fake and a fraud. Yeah. When we'll talk about that in a minute, as that relates to addiction. Yes. For sure. So you. Found a place to go? Did you did you go so, to recovery or what? Did so you do? I I came back up to you know Dallas, withdrew from school. Mm -hmm. I'd been in trouble at SMU. Mm -hmm. They, you know, the semester before, you know, the spring semester of my sophomore year. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I got in a lot of trouble on campus. You know, I sat on a lady officer. You know, grabbed the mic out of her hand and said, "Come get me, rent a cops." And wow. they wanted to expel me. Sure, but I was shocking. <laughs> yes, yeah. but I and and kind of in my story, five years later, I become the alcohol and drug counselor at there, SMU. At SMU, <laughs> I mean, if that's not God's grace, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, I I went to um, that that position was Sam Brito, who mm -hmm. I ended up taking five years later. Mm -hmm. I went to him and said, I need help. And he gave us some suggestions. Mm -hmm. And then my mom did some more research. Yeah. Um, and so I ended up going to this place in Arizona mm -hmm. and it was right for me at the time. Yeah. And so that, that really started that road, that journey yeah. that I've been on now for 33 years. Yeah. On that journey yourself in terms of, you know, just practicing the steps, just all those things, yes. but also helping so many people over the last three decades. Really, it's pretty remarkable when you think about 
It is. Times. It is. It is like pausing and going, wow, God, you know, when I thought I had nothing to offer, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was, you know, at SMU, I'd grown up in San Antonio. Oh, I guess I'll do real mm -hmm. estate, you know, thinking that's what everybody else does, mm -hmm. you know, but God has opened doors where I'm truly in a, in a completely different field than I thought of when I think about my youngest being in yeah. college right now. Yeah. So I met you, I met, I met who you were before I actually met you. Yeah, I remember when, that. Yeah, because I came here in uh, 2003 to serve as the pastor to youth and families. And uh, it wasn't long before I was asking people, who should I recommend as a counselor? And your name just kept coming up over and over again. Because I trusted the people who were recommending you, I just started encouraging families to send their high school students to you. And it was, I mean, maybe a year and a half or so, and I still had never met you. And yeah. then finally we meet, and I could see why people were so encouraged by um, the work that you were doing and helping you know, their children and those family units along. Um, and it's been sweet to know you ever since. But talk a little bit about addiction. You know, today I'd love for people listening or watching to walk away with, okay, I understand addiction better than I used to. I know there's a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of probably presuppositions that people have, but could you just define addiction and then kind of explain how addiction impacts a person's life? Yeah, I, I would love to first start, you know, if I was if I was in a 12-step meeting, how uh -huh. I would introduce myself, yeah. I'd go, hi, I'm Chico, I'm a recovered alcoholic. Okay. And you would say recovered in the past tense. Yes. Now. Okay. Tell yeah. me why. And so I love uh, saying recovered because I, I am recovered mm -hmm. and I believe in what the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous talks about. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, in the forward to the first edition, it said, we are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Yeah. Say that one more time. We are more than 100 men and women mm -hmm. who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And that's in the forward to the first edition? That's the, in the forward to the first edition. That's in the fourth edition now. Yeah, right. Okay, and what year was that written? The The first edition was written in 1937. Yeah, I, know, I knew it was a long time ago, but yes. I bet a lot of people listening had no idea. Yeah, and so I love... I love that because I was at that seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, mm -hmm. even though, you know, on August 28th, 1989, I was 20, just shy of my 21st birthday. Mm -hmm. And I was already at that seemingly hopeless yeah. state of mind. Such a great mind. phrase, seemingly hopeless. Because even in that statement, there's hope. There right? is hope. Seemingly hopeless. But and there's a lot later of... on in that book, it, I mean, in that same paragraph, this is precisely why we wrote this book, mm -hmm. to show others how we have recovered. Yeah, that's beautiful. You know? And so I love just the the simplicity of it, mm -hmm. but it, it yet it is pretty, you know, um, deep at the yeah. same time. Yeah. You know, so when you, when I, when you talk about addiction, I, I love, it's, it's pretty, it's simple, but complex mm -hmm. in, in the simplicity of it is, you know, we have an allergy of the body and an obsession of the mind. Okay. And then there's this spiritual malady going on. Right. Um, and so it's kind of three in one, mm -hmm. you know, so the allergy of the body is, you know, people talk about cravings. Mm -hmm. You know, the craving actually doesn't occur until like this water bottle. Mm -hmm. If this was alcohol and I started to drink it, mm -hmm. an allergic reaction would happen. Mm -hmm. You know, where I believe, and they've, they've shown it scientifically, I believe that allergic reaction happens where then all of a sudden I crave more. Yeah, and, and that's I, not true for every person. No, right? most people. I mean, Shannon drinks. Mm -hmm. You know, my oldest son drinks. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have this allergy of the body. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't get this craving. Mm -hmm. I Sometimes I like to frame it, Mark, in, you know, nowadays, I mean, when we were kids, no one grew up. I didn't know anybody that grew up with a peanut allergy. Yeah, right, you know, right. Every, yeah. It's everywhere. Yeah, right. But it, it's kind of the opposite of a peanut allergy. Mm -hmm. Your your throat closes up, mm -hmm. from what I understand about a peanut allergy. Right. Uh, but for the alcoholic, your throat opens, opens up. Opens up more, more. And you want more. Yeah. Exactly. And so all of a sudden, it's like that allergy occurs, and then we go on a spree. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we go until, you know, we 
you know, we ne- there's never enough. Nothing mm-hmm. never satisfies. Mm-hmm. Then some kind of consequence happens, and so it's like it's like this cycle. Yeah, you call it the cycle of addiction. Cycle. It's called the cycle. Yeah, of addiction. I remember the first time you presented that to me and the elders of our church as we were dealing with that issue. It was so helpful. So can you explain what that looks yeah, like? Yeah, and so it, you know, if I had this dry erase board, I'd have allergy over here, mm-hmm. you know, in the body, and all of a sudden, you know. You, you take your substance, whatever drug of no choice is, mm-hmm. um, and all of a sudden you get, the craving occurs. Mm-hmm. And then you go on a spree. And the spree can be one day, it could be six months. Right. It could be longer. Mm-hmm. You know, then what happens is you get down here towards the bottom of the circle and you have consequences. You know, something happens. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, it might be for me, it was like jail, but I had consequences all before that. Right. You know, consequences with my parents, consequences with the fraternity, consequences with friends. But it was that that moment uh, happened where I had had consequences happen many times before, been arrested many times before, you know, f- for my drunken, you know, behavior. Right. And I would make down here at the bottom of the circle uh, this firm resolution. Or sometimes I like to say, I'll never do that again. Yeah. You know, and I would get to that place of I never, and then what would happen is I'd start to go up here. I'm not drinking. I'm not using drugs. You know, I I switched my freshman year of uh, college. I switched from drinking, and I went six months without drinking, but I was smoking pot every day. Yeah, just trade one one, one for the allergy other. for another, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. and so, but bef- but there have been times that I would stop drinking or smoking pot or doing those things. I would even. I, I would even get involved in different church activities. Mm-hmm. You know, I would, uh, you know, I believe my my day of uh, salvation was November 26 of 89. Mm-hmm. But I had been involved in the church and been involved in youth ministries. Mm-hmm. But over here, I became restless, irritable, discontent. Yeah, That's, which are critical words to yes, understand. R-I-D. Yeah, restless, irritable, discontent. Yeah. And so when I, and I didn't have a solution. Uh-huh. And so then that's where, you know, I said allergy of the body, then up here is the mental obsession. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew how to relieve that, that mental obsession. And that was that restlessness, that irritability, mm-hmm. that discontent. Mm-hmm. And so that's where that mental obsession, the, the mind kicks in mm-hmm. and the mind kicks in is like, I know what can relieve it. And I would believe it. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll just have one drink. Mm-hmm. But see, I, I didn't know anything about this allergy. Right. And the allergy would then kick in as soon as I had that one drink. Yeah, because the, the mind is looking at relief. I yes. want relief from whatever's making me restless, irritable, and discontent. And so the obsession then moves towards the, the lie that this is the answer. And suddenly the allergy kicks in and you're back. In, in that cycle. cycle again. Yeah. You know, and we are in the mind is so good at rationalizing, justifying, and minimizing. Yeah. While we're talking specifically about alcohol and other drugs, just for the sake of this conversation, what are other things that people might turn to that, you know, beyond alcohol and other drugs that would be promising that relief that could become an addiction? Well, you said it earlier about, mm-hmm. you know, at the beginning of this, mm-hmm. you know, podcast is you said, you know, process addictions that can be, you know, sex, Mm -hmm. you know, that can be spending, you know, Mm -hmm. that can be gambling, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, sometimes we even, you, you could get people that are obsessive about work, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like they're working all the time, but then their families, you know, are suffering suffering big time. And so there's all these consequences and then they get restless, irritable, discontent. They don't know how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll just I'll just go and do you know this project again. So in that cycle, um, the addiction, the allergy has set its course. There comes a point where the consequences, minor or large, has a person at a place of I've got to change, right? And at that moment, talk about how deceptive an addict becomes. What's going on in the heart and mind of somebody who's really struggling in that? to the point where they really believe themselves what they're saying, even though others may not believe it at all, they're really believing it. Because I think that's where some people, you know, if they're parents of an addict or whatever, they just want to say, stop it. 
You know, just stop it. <laughs> yeah. You know, Bob Newhart, that old joke. But talk about why that reality is so strong um, in terms of the deception, the chameleon you talked about earlier. Yeah. And so you're down here at that uh -huh. place of that firm resolution. I'm right. not going to do this again. The I never. And you really believe it. Like, I'm not going to do this. And I, I've said it in my office, you know, to families and family members is like, you know, we give your loved one a, a polygraph test. They're going to pass the polygraph test. Yeah, they're that good. They're that good. They even, you even believe that you're, you're going to change. Yeah. You know, but then right here, um, you believe you're going to change, but you come up with what, what I like to call, it's like the person in the throes of addiction, they're not in denial. Mm. You know, they're delusional. Okay. That's, that's important because some people yes. would have said it different. Yeah. yeah. And so we, we thought that for a long time that, oh, that person, you know, let's use me. Oh, he's in denial about his addiction. I mean, his fraternity, his friends, his mm -hmm. parents, the university, the police, everybody's saying, hey, you got a problem here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I might admit I'm, I somewhat have a problem, mm -hmm. you know, but I was delusional thinking that I could somehow, some way, uh, control it. Mm -hmm. You know, I would have a, a little brief period of, yeah. of control. Yeah. Which sounds to me, it's worse than denial because denial is, I don't have a problem. Delusion is, I know I have a problem at some level, but I can still fix it. Yes. I have the ability with this self. firm resolution. Yes. Self at the center. Yeah. yeah. And so that, and so what I like when working with families is the families are in denial. Mm. You know, the addict is delusional. It's interesting. You know, the families go, well, you know, what we think of alcoholics. I, ha I have a good doctor friend, you know, that, you know, his wife, he's brilliant. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, if, if I needed or my family needed surgery, that's the guy I would go to. You know, but he comes to me because he just doesn't understand addiction. Mm-hmm. You know, he, you know, he's told his wife several times, just, just stop, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, I love when he shared it with me, he, his wife said, you know, she was in treatment. She goes, Hey, there's a house full of other women here that's husbands had told them to stop. I can't stop. It's, I have this disease. Yeah. So I got to learn new tools yeah. on how to function. I got to get a whole new way of a whole new perspective. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people probably struggle with seeing if they've never had any exposure to an addict. I think I was in this category until I had a family member, um, one of my siblings, you know, go through an addiction to cocaine. And I remember she was in California. And when I learned about it, I was just like, what are you doing? You know, and I literally said to her, from now on, let me control your life. Don't make any decisions <laughs> yeah. without asking me. When I, and I believe that was the thing that would be most helpful to her. But she couldn't stop, you know, and she ended up in prison. She lost a job. You know, it, it was horrific. She's great now. I mean, she's walking in a life of sobriety. But the pain and the consequences of what took place were so, so real and so dark. So I really didn't understand addiction. And so some people just think, well, it's just sin, so stop it. And it is sin. It's a, it's a product of sin. But it's more than that in terms of understanding the fact that it's called a disease. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Well, and the, I love the, the simple approach about disease. Mm -hmm. If you were to write out disease up here, D-I-S, put a slash, mm -hmm. and then E-A-S-E, -E, mm -hmm. you know, there's dis-ease in the mm -hmm. soul. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think all of us can identify with that, even right. if you're not an addict. Right. Absolutely. You know? And so, but the addict, you know, has this allergy on top of it mm -hmm. that says, you know, more. And then they do destructive stuff. They steal from you. They get arrested. Right. You know, they're abusive. You know, they're, they're violent, you know, or they withdraw. Right. It's not all the you same know, for each person. Each person is different. Right. And each, each person, how, how their body processes you know, the substance of their choice, of their yeah. no choosing. Right. You know, so you lose the power of choice. All of a sudden, the alcohol, if you just, I I just like alcohol, and it's the same for the other substances, mm -hmm. but it's just, when I say alcoholic, I also mean addict. Right. You know, it falls into that same category. But when you say alcohol, they've lost the power of choice. All of a sudden, the alcohol starts to choose you. Mm-hmm. 
you know, and so a lot of people, you know, I think 85%, you know, of our Western culture can drink, Mm -hmm. you know, I think 10 to 15% really don't need to be drinking. Yeah. Just because because of what's going to happen. You know, it's like diet, like diabetics, Mm -hmm. you know, they're, you know, a diabetic, their pancreas doesn't, you know, process, Mm -hmm. you know, the sugars. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, type one diabetics need insulin. Right. Because the, you know, their pancreas doesn't, you know, uh, process the insulin. The same thing with the alcoholic. Right. It doesn't process, you know, the alcohol. Right. And so when a person, you know, finds himself in that place of consequence, or when a family is encountering that now, whether it's a high school student, college student, middle school student, a spouse, yeah. whatever it might be, whoever it might be, um, the consequence takes place. You said families are often in denial, the addict, he or she's delusional. What, what would you say to a family that's in denial? Like, how would you help them begin to see, hey, this is a serious issue? You can see their firm resolve, what they're trying to do, but you've got to understand the reality of what's taking place. How do you help families see that? Well, I, that's a great question because with, with family members, it's like, okay, you know, help, help them understand the disease concept, the mm-hmm. cycle of addiction, mm-hmm. you know, and when you begin to break that down, it's like they've lost that power of choice. Mm-hmm. But then talk, I, it, alcoholism, a drug addiction, it's a shame-based disease. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, family members, it, cancer is not a shame-based disease. Yeah. You know, other diseases aren't shame based. Yeah, but this one is. This one is mm-hmm. because all of a sudden it's like, how come you don't have the willpower? Right. Back yeah. to the, the the confusion that exists for some and why yeah. they would never want to call it what yes. you're calling it. Yeah. Yeah, and so I mean it. I mean, spiritually speaking, I think all diseases are sin based. Sure. You know, I can say cancer is, you know, we are all fallen. Yeah, it's it's a consequence of living in a fallen world. Exactly. You know, I don't get cancer because, I mean, I guess there's things I could put in my body that maybe helped enable that. But in other words, not everybody that eats poorly, you know, dies of a heart attack, right? Yes. But consequences of a sinful world, you know, sin in us, sin that's in the world around us, the consequences of sin all around us affects us. So I get what you're saying. Yeah, and so that's where sometimes the, you know, the hardest you know, family members to work with are believers mm-hmm. because they just say, well, okay, maybe they're not praying hard enough. Yeah, just repent. Yes. Yeah. You know, and so that's what I love about Alcoholics Anonymous, mm-hmm. you know, is, you know, the founders of that were really uh, people that poured into him was this guy, Evie, that was part of the Oxford group, mm-hmm. you know, and the Oxford group was a discipleship group of men mm-hmm. that had, you know, six principles. Now, mm-hmm. Alcoholics Anonymous put it into 12 steps. Right. And those six principles, they they really had four core, you know, values Mm -hmm. from the original Oxford movement. What were those four values? Honesty, purity, um, love, and unselfishness. Mm. You know, and so I love those. Honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. Love. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's the order of the four. And so when, when you think about that, that's really what it was about. Purity, is this the right thing that I need to do? Yeah. You know, it, I, I love, you know, in, in the 12 steps, it's just, you know, you, you hear this comment all the time, do the next right thing. Right. And that's really the, the purity, right? Yes. That's what's the right, pure, best thing for me to do. Yes. And so that's that's where it comes up. So when you're working with with families, it's like, you know, helping, you know, really helping them understand, hey, this isn't your fault. Mm-hmm. You know, they, you know, there's this, uh, these four, you know, things in Al-Anon, that's for the family members. Uh-huh. You know, you didn't cause it. You can't cure it. You can't control it. You can contribute mm-hmm. for healthy or unhealthy. Yeah, enable or, yes. right. You know, and so helping them understand understand, okay, what part are they playing in this? Mm -hmm. Are they trying to control it? Mm -hmm. You know, like you gave a good example, since Mm -hmm. you gave it, is like, oh, I'm going to control this. Right. Yeah. (laughs) With my sibling. Yeah. It's like, oh, just let me run your life. Yes. Yeah. And I believed it. Yes. Like, I believe this is what she needed. And, and, and your intent was good. Right. But with the addict, the approach sucked. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't until, you know, she got around other women mm-hmm. that poured into her and gave her that hope that I, right. you know, talked about to unpack, right. you know, the delusional thinking. Right. You know, I like what the big book says. The delusion has to be smashed. Mm-hmm. That's a great statement. Yes. I mean, it yeah. just, when, when you, you know, and when that delusion is, is smashed, there's, you, you've completed the first step. Mm. How does an individual know it's smashed? Like what, what happens in their heart and their mind where it's not just another way of... Being st- down here. In yeah. The, and the resolve, yeah, right. But it's really, no, it's, it's smashed. You know, it's, it's obliterated. Yeah. I, uh, I, that... Another good question. Uh, I think when when a person gets to that place of of truly of surrender, yeah, you know that man that person hadn't surrendered. They're giving you lip service, mm-hmm. you know. So you can kind of with other people in in their life, mm-hmm. they can you know call BS on them, yeah, that have been there, right? They can see it. Yes, I mean I was I was delusional and I had those firm resolutions, and mm-hmm. yet I hadn't surrendered, right? You know, I, my moment of clarity, you know, happened when I woke up in jail and no one was bailing me out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, you know, there there was still some of that delusional thinking mm-hmm. during the process. Because it's not necessarily a one and done. No. I mean, it can be for some people. Yes. I mean, some people really can't have that moment of deliverance. And God's faithful that way. But he also is faithful in the ways where deliverance sometimes is over many days or weeks or months or really a life. Yes. And some people, you know, all of a sudden they relapse. That doesn't no. mean, like, I think that's what you're saying, Mark, in no. the sense of that doesn't mean um, that everything they've done the last few weeks or few months yeah, is a waste. Is a waste. No mm-hmm. seeds were planted. Right. You know, they, okay, they, you know, they messed up. They right. made a mistake. They, you know, they knew the tools. Mm hmm. Yet they got back into that selfishness, self-centeredness. Mm-hmm. And that, in a Christian culture, if they profess Christ, they're with a family that professes Christ, that can even be an added level of shame then yes. if you've had a relapse, right? Which is not helpful when a person really just needs to hear once again the power of grace to help you then continue to have that delusion exposed and smashed, right? Yes, and so I, I like that because there can be that, it, you know, extra shame added mm-hmm. on. Uh-huh. And so when that extra shame is added on is like, I, I still believe speaking the truth in love, mm-hmm. you know, okay, what, what happened? Mm-hmm. Let's unpack that. Right. Now, if they're still delusional and they're fighting it, I mean, be direct with them. Mm-hmm. But if they come to you and go, man, I messed up. I, you know, I got high last night. Mm -hmm. You know, I did this, you know, I went and picked up a prostitute. Okay. You know, if you, if you can kind of sense that remorse, okay, what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, and you get curious with them in Mm -hmm. that moment. Yeah. Is one of the signs of a person's seriousness with their delusion, um, a, a willingness Certainly to surrender, you know, even the big book talks about surrendering to a power, you know, and as we are Christians, we talk about that being Christ, the ultimate power to help set us free. But is part of the surrender evidence of a willingness to surrender to others, to go through the steps with someone else, to have accountability that's really direct and frequent, like daily? How does that work into knowing whether a person is really willing to surrender? Yeah, I I think you answered the question. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like if if they are if you're seeing that evidence by you know them getting a sponsor, mm-hmm. you know them actually working the steps and taking direction. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, sponsorship is really finding someone that you want what they have. Mm. You know, in our Christian culture, it's like you you get someone to disciple you. Right. You, you hear about that. I, I you know I know mm. you've discipled some men, you right. know, how come they spend time with you? They want what you have, Mark. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, they that, see that. Yeah, you know, your relationship with your wife, your, you know, your kids and right. stuff like that. It's like, I. that's what I, I like when you see that in, in the church. That's the same thing that's mm-hmm. happening, you know, in the 12 steps is you want something they have. And so they're they're beginning to do those things. And then the, the great thing is they get excited and they want to share that with someone else. Mm-hmm. You know, they want to, you know, you know, 
be of service. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's what that unselfishness really those those four principles from the Oxford group is be of service. Yeah. You know, how can I be of service? How can I help that other person? Yeah. You know, and so when you see that, okay, they they're they're at that place of if they've worked the steps, been with the sponsor, have, you know, or sponsor another men or women, mm-hmm. um, if they're a woman, mm-hmm. you know, I recommend that. I don't right. recommend the uh, opposite, opposite sex, sex. Right. <laughs> yeah. you know, for obvious reasons. Sure. Uh, but then you go, okay, they're, they're doing that. Um, man, they're recovered mm-hmm. from that seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Yeah. Thank you. This is so helpful. When, um, when a family encounters, you know, the, just the tragedy of addiction in their life, um, spouse, child, parent, whatever it might be. Um, what are some things that are almost always present as hindrances to them getting help? Like, what are the things that if you could say, just put those down quickly, um, what do you see? And the, the work that you've done over the last few decades, what, what, you know, really is just getting people stuck or making them delay what ultimately is going to need to happen. A couple of those things were earlier I said, man, not just the addict mm-hmm. um, is rationalizing, justifying, and minimizing, mm-hmm. you know, is the family members are rationalizing, justifying, and minimizing. We, it, it's the excuses. Yeah. You know, the excuses, well, you know, they had, you know, had a rough childhood. Yeah. Or, you know, they're going through a divorce or, you know, uh, they lost their job. There's some circumstance present or past that's justifying the reason. The behavior. That they're behaving this way. Yes. Yeah. And so they're not really looking at their relationship to the substance or the process. Mm -hmm. They're really looking at external factors. And what's the fear underneath all that? Is it what other people will think about us? Is it just fear that it could be worse than we think, so we'll minimize it so it doesn't appear to be that bad? What's going on? What What's making a person act that way? Well, if, if it's family members, it's like, I think, uh, what are people going to think of us? Yeah. You know, I, you know, there's this parent shame. Yeah. You know, where did I go wrong? Right. Like I had, you know, it, but if I truly believe I didn't cause this, cure it, you know, I can't control it. Yeah. You know. Which really, I mean, that that's helpful parenting advice, even if addiction doesn't exist. Exactly. Right. But the fear of man is so prevalent in our culture and which Pervasive creates- on everything. Everywhere. Everything. No matter yes. what it is. And so anything that gives evidence that, okay, something's not right, we really, I mean, I counsel people all the time in certain situations, many different vary, varying situations. And I always say, you're not alone. Yeah. I mean, you're really not alone. There's somebody else- in our church or somewhere else in this community that has already been down that road. I promise. But well, and they, I think they feel so well. It. You know, mm-hmm. it's like that I the common thing is everybody believes they're, they're alone. alone. Yeah. You know, that uh, that, you know, that they they believe that loneliness that no one else will understand. Yeah. Or they'll reject us if yes. they did know. You know, we'll lose whatever we have. Yeah. And what do we really have? Mm-hmm. You know, is yeah. but there's there's that that fear, and I, I like you said, fear of man, mm-hmm. fear of what others think, mm-hmm. fear of comparison. Mm-hmm. You know, I I like the big book. It talks about you know we are driven by a hundred forms of fear yeah. and self seeking. Yeah, hundreds forms of fear. Yeah, it's more than that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I but I like it because if if we really break it down, you know. Working with men, you know, I, I don't work as much. When we first met, I was working with younger people. Yeah. Now I'm working with people my age. Right. You know, they don't, the younger people don't value me as much. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, you know, working with men is like, you know, we are fearful as mm-hmm. men, but man, our pride kicks our butt. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to admit our fear. Right. Fear that I'm not being a good husband, or I'm not being a good provider, fear that I can't control my drinking, you know, whatever the fear is, you know, fear is all over. It's pervasive. Well, and think about that contributing to the cycle of addiction and the yes. restless, irritable, and discontent. You know, it it can come from so many forms. And if your identity is not secure in something other than those se- secondary things that are going to bring you pleasure and peace with the opposite of restless, irritable, and discontent, you're really going to be in trouble at some point very quickly. 
oh, hands down. And so mm-hmm. it's like, can, can I step back and go, okay, am I all right? Yeah. You know, and so when when you get involved, what I, what I like about it is it's really where recovery takes place mm-hmm. is really through community, not mm-hmm. just sponsorship, but not feeling alone. Mm-hmm. You know, talk about that for a little bit. Like, what does that practically look like if somebody is at a place, even if they're listening to this, and they could be anywhere in the country or really in the world? They're like, okay, I think he's describing me. Um, what would you tell them, like, to imagine? would take place if they reached out for help, whether it's AA or some other steps program, what would, what can they imagine taking place? Well, Ed, I remember my first AA meeting. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll share that. My first one, people were laughing about the consequences in their life. And I really, I was a 20 year old kid. Yeah. these people got to be smoking pot. <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, how come they're laugh? I just got out of jail. Yeah. You know, I just assaulted a police officer. I mean, I'm facing some serious stuff yeah. here. Mm-hmm. You know, I withdrew from college. I, I went there and I go, no, they, that it was all, all right. I didn't feel alone. Mm. You know, I, I, you know, because I was, you, I had that mask and that cover up mm-hmm. is like, no, I, all of a sudden I could take that down, mm-hmm. you know? And so there was this sense, this community that, okay, I'm not alone. That you know, I wasn't, a, you know, those people weren't exalting the behaviors, yeah. but they were going, okay, that doesn't define me. Yeah. They're that just in a different place. Yes. That doesn't define me. That doesn't make me, you know, who I am. And so that's why community matters so much because every one of those people are, in a different place in terms of their, you know, posture. They're, they're all in the posture of surrender, but in terms of their duration, like some have been there maybe a long time, some are brand new like you, but you can begin to see I'm not alone. Yeah. To, this morning I have a, I have a group of men mm-hmm. that are around the country that are in my field. And, mm-hmm. you know, today is my buddy, uh, 53rd sobriety. Wow. Anniversary. Wow. 53 years. Yeah. He got sober in 1969. Wow. Yeah. I was three. You weren't even born yet. <laughs> yeah. No, I was, I was almost one. Just okay. Shy of my yeah. first birthday. And so it, I, I mean, I love that. It's like we, and we talked about friendship today, mm. you know, and then another buddy of mine, you know, he's a few years older, he's 58 mm-hmm. and man, we have this common bond, this admiration for each other. But if you look at us politically, we are polar opposites. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I am conservative, and he is not. Is, is not. Mm-hmm. You know, and in how our country is today. Sure. There's just this. Yeah. This, but man, you know, a couple of those men shared about me and Brian's friendship, mm-hmm. and you go, man, in our world today, they wouldn't be friends. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that man. And yeah. I teared up sharing how much I loved him. Yeah. You know, because we have this admiration because I know, I know the work that he went through mm-hmm. just like he knows the work that I've gone through. Right. And we continue to do our own work. Mm-hmm. You know. So talk about that. You know, you said you have recovered, right? Yes. Yet that doesn't mean we don't continue to do the work. Yes. And so what's the work? I, I love the work because I, I, you know, the, the, you know, the big book, which I like to refer to, the big book says in step 10, step 10 is continue to take personal inventory and when we are wrong, promptly admit it. Mm-hmm. Later on in that paragraph, when it's talking about that, and it talks about it in several paragraphs, it goes, continue to watch for four things, selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. And then the way they wrote that book, Mm -hmm. the next sentence, I love the next sentence. It says, when these crop up, Mm -hmm. it doesn't say if. if. Yeah. And so when it says, when these crop up, we know what to do. Make right your wrongs, you know, see how you can be of service to others, you know, and love and tolerance is our code, Mm -hmm. you know, and then a couple paragraphs later, it goes, it talks about, you know, uh, we aren't cured, what we have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Yeah. You know, and so if my spiritual condition, if I'm in selfishness, self-centeredness, my spiritual condition is not there. Right. You know, it's weak. It's, it's jaded. It's right. 
it, it's, you know, all jacked We would talk up. about, as believers, John 15, you know, yeah. not, not abiding in Christ, not connected to the source of that power that's going to give you the ability by God's grace and for his glory to resist those temptations, to reject those things, or to be truthful and honest, you know, about what's taking place in your life. What are you thinking about? What have you been looking at? Um, you know, where have you been selfish? And there's nothing more beautiful than what the word of God shows us in terms of that in inventory that we take, which the big book, which you encouraged me to read years ago, uh, really does such a great job of saying, here's some real practical ways you yeah. can apply. They don't say it that way, but these these biblical principles, which would help us all be more honest about the condition of our souls. Yeah. And so in, in that group of men, we've been meeting on Zoom now, you know, the week before COVID yeah. officially started, but I named us the Notorious Sinners <laughs> from, yeah. from Matthew 9, yeah. when Jesus eats with, right. you know, Matthew right. and other Notorious Sinners, yeah. you know, and how he talks about uh, when the disciples were questioned by the Pharisees, you know, what... Why does he, he eat with people like that? Yeah. yeah. And he goes... And Jesus overheard him and said, you know, I didn't come for the healthy, but for the sick. Mm -hmm. You know, and as addicts, we're sick. As family yeah. members of addicts, we're sick. Yeah. You know, but what does he then say? I love what Jesus says. He says, but go and learn what this means. Mm -hmm. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Yeah, so good. You know, and so I love that. I love, you know, I, I try to live out when I say doing the work. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, mm -hmm. let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess yeah. for he who promised is faithful. Mm -hmm. You know, let, let us not give, give up, up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let us spur one another on yeah. towards love and good deeds. I would say this, you know, in terms of the model of meeting daily, of having a sponsor you know, the church could learn a lot about how to practice some of those things just in discipleship because we're all fallen. You know, we're all sinners. Every day we receive an onslaught of temptations that are common to man, and yet we often live in isolation and don't have those kind of regular, very transparent and honest conversations about the ways in which we are struggling, you know, and the word tells us, confess your sins to one another so you know how to pray for one another, which we need to be doing. And somebody could be watching this and just simply saying, I'm so thankful that addiction isn't in my family, that my children aren't addicts or my spouse isn't an addict, but we're all sinners, you yeah. know, and sin is lurking in us. The enemy's attacking all around us, and it can manifest itself with addiction, or it can manifest itself in a whole host of other ways. But the same thing is true. We are desperate for our Savior to deliver us from that, and he has given us himself in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen to that. I know, I know. I mean, but that's that's the exciting thing. And I like what you said is we we can learn from, you know, that 12-step community. Yeah. We can learn that, okay, hey, can I come just as a broken individual? Yeah. I, I bought the big book. I told you this before we started this podcast, but you and I met, which we need to have lunch more often yeah. again. That was always fun. But we met right before we went on a sabbatical. And my sabbatical, I was studying spiritual warfare. What does the Bible happen to say about that and about demons and exorcisms and all that stuff? So I was at Barnes & Noble, and I had found several books, you know, on that subject matter. And then I saw the big book. I was like, I'm going to grab it. So I go to check out, and I've got the big book. <laughs> <laughs> and underneath it, it's books on, like, exorcisms and demonic oppression and all this stuff. And then I look at the young lady checking me out, and I'm like, she is like, My who God. is this guy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Anyway, um, there is so much... And we believe all truth is God's truth. There's so much there that really is helpful in just the ideas of discipleship, where we as a church obviously stand on the Word of God, which calls us to live that kind of life where we are transparent before the Lord and one another for the sake of um, bringing Him glory, that abiding relationship with Christ. And I think that's beautiful the way they've described that. I, I think we all need somebody like a sponsor walking in our lives and helping us, whatever it is. I think of Psalm 119, where it says, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. Well, there's a lot of worthless things. We're going to do a deal on addiction to pornography uh, in the weeks to come. There's so many worthless things that we're tempted to look at. 
And it's a, not uncommon. And yet, for most of us, we don't want anybody to know that that's there because we're afraid if they saw that that's what we're looking at, the way we're thinking, um, they would reject us. And the truth is, we're all going to experience that cycle. It's called the cycle of addiction, but it's really the cycle of sin, right? That I'm going to find myself in a place of being restless, irritable, and discontent. I'm definitely going to find my place in being able to say, I've made these firm resolutions and I'm going to fall short. And when I do, where am I going to turn? Am I really going to turn to the Lord in absolute dependence or am I going to turn to something else? Yeah. And that middle of the circle is, you know, for me and you is Christ. That's right. Other people, it might be whatever power greater than themselves. Right. You know, but that is like, man, can we do that? Yeah. You know, and so, and you know, that's what I love about the 12 steps. I shared it earlier in the Oxford movement mm -hmm. was a discipleship group of men. Right. You know, that started in the early 19th century. And you said the number, there's a hundred of us. Is that what you said? Yeah. The, so the guys who wrote the first 164 pages, yeah. there were more than 100, more than 100 men and women. Yeah. And so, you know, a, a lot of the credit was, you know, Bill Wilson, you know, and Dr. Bob Smith, yeah. you know, those two, you know, you know, came together and there's yeah. good, there's some good, you know, movies about that and stuff like that, right. but those two, but it was Bill Wilson had spent time with Abby who was in the Oxford group mm -hmm. and Abby showed him this. And then Bill Wilson was, he was a traveling salesman in 1935 and he was, he was struggling. He was wanting to drink. He was restless, irritable, discontent. Yeah. And so he was in Akron, Ohio, and he, he heard that there was this <coughs> doctor, Dr. Bob, mm -hmm. um, and someone gave him his number, and he called him, and they spent like six hours wow. just talking, and neither one of them drank that night. Wow. So yeah, it's really so the beginning. That's, that's where it started. That was early start. That's really interesting. Yeah. Well, in the time we've left... Is there anything that you think we haven't covered that you're like, this would be really important? I mean, there's a lot more we could talk about, but as we kind of begin to introduce this topic, there's going to be several people that I interview, it's probably six or seven weeks worth of this podcast on addiction. Anything that you're like, boy, this is important to know or something else to say that we haven't covered? Well, what I I like to say, you, I mean, you kind of identified it with, with just sin, the cycle of addiction. Yeah. I always say, you know, a lot of times when people are addicts, we say the opposite, they're the codependent, mm -hmm. you know, but before we came up with the word for codependent, mm -hmm. you know, that's the loved ones of the addict, right? You know, that's a nice phrase that they came up with back in the eighties. Yeah. You know, but before we called them the codependent, we called them the co-addict. They were addicted to the person, mm -hmm. the alcoholic, the yeah. alcoholics addicted to a substance the codependent, or how I like to call it, the co-addict, mm -hmm. is addicted to the person. What does that mean? Alcoholic. What does it mean that they're addicted to the person? I think I think they have the same thing, the allergy of the body and the obsession of the mind. Mm. You know, they get in there and they try to fix, they control. Yeah. You know, they get in there and all of a sudden, it, in, it, in a way, I think it's a mental allergy, yeah. not a physical one. Yeah. But, but the obsession it, begins to consume them. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I can do this. I can fix this. Yeah. Interesting. You know, and then they get spit on, their their family members steal from them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're hiding their purses in the, you know, in their bedroom. Yeah. You know, I and they make firm resolutions. I'm not gonna do this again. And once again, Boom. because it's so hard to draw the line, especially if it's a child. Yes. You know, it's almost impossible. Yeah. It is impossible outside of the of relying on your, your own power. So really what happens is the codependent has to go through the steps themselves. Exactly. Independent of the other yes. person. Yes, and, and to see their part of that. And so then, you know, they get restless, irritable, discontent. Their, their son, their daughter, their spouse, oh, is doing well. Oh, well, we'll buy him a car. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's just, how come? Yeah. You know, it's like, you got to get, you got to get to that place of curiosity. Yeah. What's going on internally with you? Yeah. And we, we're in a community, obviously, in Dallas, where there's a lot of means. So a lot of families have tremendous resources at their disposal. And as it relates to codependency, how does that sometimes work against someone really coming to the end of themselves? In other words, what are different ways that we try to care for them, but it ends up slowing the process or creating more harm? 
Does that make sense? Yeah. And so lots of times I, you know, if, if you were in my office, I would grab a pillow off the couch and throw it down mm -hmm. on the ground. We, we give them a soft pillow. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a lot of means, it, it doesn't mean you're immune. Yeah. You just have means. And so what they do is they'll bail them out. Yeah. You know, they'll, they'll take away those consequences. They'll, they'll not. Because that seems loving. Yes. It's not just loving. bail them out of a jail or something like that if they get a DWI or arrested for possession. Mm -hmm. But they'll bail them out of facing the consequences if, if they're an adult of, you know, paying a mortgage. Yeah. You know, doing those things that continue to perpetuate you know, that problem. Don't, don't allow them to face the natural consequences. Some people might call it, you know, tough love. Yeah. You know, some people might call it, you know, you know, those kind of things, Yeah. but just having some natural consequences. Yeah. You know, so how does a, what does a person need in their life to protect them from becoming that enabler to protect them from, I mean, cause I've heard a lot of people who have dealt with alcoholism or drug addiction in their family. And almost every story, the parents say, we prolonged this in ways we didn't know we were prolonging it. So at what point is it helpful for somebody else to step into the life to say, let us let us give you some direction yeah. on what you're doing and how it's slowing this down? Well, we had, you know, Mark, you know some of my story. I've had, you know, different treatment centers that I've sold. Yeah. And the last one before I started it, the 90 day men's program mm -hmm. that I sold, I spent a year and a half going, I want to create a treatment program where I bring in the family members for 30 days and leave the addict at home. Mm -hmm. Cause if I can help them learn how to set boundaries mm -hmm. and not be part of the problem, mm -hmm. then that addict has a little more hope. Yeah. You know, they'll face those natural consequences. But yeah. I, I did all this performance and I go, no one's going to come. So right, right, <laughs> right. I pivoted. Yeah. You know. I'm sorry. I get it. Yes. But, but that that really does speak, though, to how how hard it is for people to come to that place of we really have to draw the line. Well, I have a family that I just worked with, mm -hmm. you know, um, their older couple and this uh, their son is actually a, a sweet kid, has some other, you know, issues, but bad alcoholic. And, you know, he had he had reached out to a lot of good people in the community mm -hmm. in the greater Dallas-Fort Worth area. Mm -hmm. And I go, you, I don't know how come you're calling me. You've gotten great counsel. And the counsel, they said, hey, you know, press charges against your son. He smashed up their, you know, office, done all these things, drunk, yeah. you know, even assaulted the dad. Mm. And the day they came in, I go, I'm, I'm not going to talk to you anymore unless, you know, you want to take, you know, my direction. Yeah. You know? And the day they came in, the son beat the crap out of the dad. He had mm. black eye. And yeah. I, I told the wife to take a picture. I go, y'all need to press charges. He mm. needs to face those natural consequences. Yeah. They left and they didn't do it. Mm. Two days later, they call me, and he beat the crap out of mom. Two oh, black eyes, well, that's so sad. finally did it. Yeah. And so the boy's there in treatment getting help. Yeah. They press charges. It's going to – it is motivating him to get a clearer head. And yeah. And it's going to take him doing the work. Yeah. But he's he's getting a clearer head and he's participating in the recovery process. Yeah. He still hadn't completely surrendered, and surrender can be a process. Sure. You know, but right now part of his surrender is he knows from speaking with me when mm -hmm. I took him down there, I go, either you're going to this treatment program or you're going to loose stare it. Here's yeah. I even have it in here. And that's jail for people yes. who don't know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I go, it's your choice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's so sad, yes. you know, but that's part of the consequences of the dynamic is we, um, we recognize. It's sad, but yesterday I spoke to him and they're hopeful today. Yeah. And that's what happens is so if somebody's watching or listening to this. It's like, well, our circumstances aren't that bad, but they could be, yes. you know, you, you don't know. And the sooner a person comes to the end of themselves, which includes those who are the co-addicts, I've never heard that phrase. The sooner we come to ourselves, the better we are to be able to say what God is needed, what needs to happen here. But I know it's so hard. I can't imagine what it might be like to have to make some of those decisions to press charges against a child or 
they might become homeless, you know, whatever it might yeah, be. Not pay their mortgage. Yeah. You just, yeah. And, and that's why community or, is so important. Or to, you know, oh, get them a job. Yeah. And that's why community yeah. is so important because people yeah. can help speak truth into your life and help you prayerfully have the courage to be like, nope, we've got to draw that line. Or, you know, people with means. Here's mm -hmm. one of the big things is people with means have their adult child working for them and they don't fire them. Yeah. When they're not showing up for work and they're doing these things and they're spending extra money yeah. on the credit card that they're not supposed yeah. to. I go, if I'm working for you, <laughs> what would you do? Yeah. I would, I, what's different? Yeah. But you just don't understand. Yeah, right? exactly. Well, this has been very, very helpful. And I know we'll have you on other podcasts in the future. Um, Chico, I'd, I'd love your story. I'm so Thank grateful you. for you, just the way the Lord's... Um, really blessed you and used you in so many people's lives. Also, I'm grateful that you continue to just speak openly about what it means to follow Christ, to be joyful in that relationship. But it is, it's notorious sinners. Yeah, it is. continue to absorb the grace of God, not in a presumptuous way, but in a way of, no, we really mean it when we say His mercies new each morning because we need it. If you are watching or listening and um, have any need, you know, whether it's because of something we've talked about today that you've heard, you have a loved one that's struggling, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach out to us at deeplight at pcpc.org. Send us an email. You can call our church at 214-224-2500. And we'll seek uh, to get you in touch with people who can begin to walk with you right now. Uh, we are very grateful to be able to hold Christ out to anybody that's listening and watching. We believe he is the way, the truth, and the life. And we believe that we're all sinners. We have all fallen short and um, are in deep need of a Savior. So we share this with you because we have that hope. And again, Chico, thanks again for Thank your time. Thank you, Mark, for having me. Thank you for listening to the Deep Light Podcast from Park City's Presbyterian Church. We would love for you to be our guest this Sunday morning as we gather together for worship at 8, 9.30, or 11 a.m. We are located in the Uptown Dallas area at the corner of Oaklawn Avenue and Wycliffe Avenue. To find out more, please visit pcpc.org.